Welcome back to another Box Score Geek show. Uh, we are running on fumes, Brian. It is the middle of the offseason. I think just past the halfway point, though, so that's the good news. We we have reached the bottom of the peak. We'll be getting out. Anyway, I'm your host, Ray Alvarez. You can find me most places as Nerd Numbers. With me, as, my, as always, is my producer, voice of God, man of many hats, Brian Foster. Say hey, Brian. Hey, what's going on, Dre? All right, so we, we got three topics for this week's show. We're going to be talking uh, statistical masturbatory enjoyment of three-point shooting efficiency. I think I said that right. It's a Reddit post, so that's their terminology, not mine. Uh, we're going to be talking win totals. I think we're, we're going to lightning round it. We'll see how good we are at that, Brian. The good news is we don't really have Patrick or Andrew on who know much more, so I'll even admit myself that with some of these, I'm, I'm just going to do a pass, if that makes sense. So if you're thinking about game shows where they're like, try this, and you just go pass, I'm, I might very well do that or just say I have no interest in, in looking at that over under. And then lastly, we're going to talk a topic you threw on the script as a shout-out, Brian. I'm promoting it ahead of time as a full-out topic, which is big shout-out to Coach Nick, uh, who mm. has been talking about uh, positive coaching and, and just ramping against some of the, the traditional coaching methods that we also hate, and I'd love to talk about that. Okay, so... Let's get to this Reddit thread, which, um, by the way, uh, I'll, I'll give the listeners some feedback. Uh, Brian, this this week, turned into a jerk summer school teacher yeah. in the sense that he gave me homework on a few occasions. And then not only that, kind of like sprung it on me. So I like got homework pop, pop quizzes. So I, I wasn't ready at all. So we're going to be talking some math. I'll be honest and say I haven't looked into it that much, but it's an interesting topic and, and one I want to discuss. So first off, uh, this is on Reddit, and it was posted by... Uh, Ergot Poisoning, a.k.a. Milwaukee Giannis Antetokounmpo. So, weird. And he, it, it, the title is, Why do some analysts fetishize the three-point percentage of non-star players so much? I hate this title. I, I, I hate this title. In, in every, you know, if you're talking clickbait, Brian, like fantastic. Yeah, this is kind of a troll post, So, but it does go somewhere eventually. Okay, so the, the point is, if you listen to the Dunked On podcast, which, full disclosure, I do not, although I'll, I'll give a shout-out to, to those that I've heard. In the annals of more mainstream, my eye-roll, mockumentary, whatever, in finger quotes, comment, advanced stats podcasts, uh, I don't hate Nate Duncan as, as much as others. In fact, he seems more savvy than most. He, he seems like... What I would hope, if this if this makes any sense, he is more of a niche blogger, right? I think he's got like a Patreon. He's got a pretty good following. He's really popular for Golden State fans. He's what I wish like ESPN was. So I wish like the niche bloggers were like more Moneyball and then the mainstream was more Nate Duncan. So, you know, not the worst, not the best. I met him at Sloan many years ago back when he, w he and I were both around the same size. Needless to say, we've gone in different directions. Okay. So he has a podcast with uh, Danny LaRue who is also an analyst, and, and they were talking about Joe Harris and, and namely what's going to happen to Joe Harris. And so here's the line that was Danny LaRue say that Danny LaRue singled out Joe Harris. So I'm reading Reddit around 76 minutes in. Dear God, 76 minutes. Who who makes podcasts that long, Brian? That's a that's a self-referential dig, people. That's me making fun of us because we always go. Long. Oh, they go on quite a bit after that. So they, they have nice two hour podcasts. Which, which I mean, I, I, by the way, just to be clear, I go both ways on that. Uh, I'm a huge fan, just preemptive shout out of the good place, the television show. And they have a podcast now and it's like, it goes 45 minutes to an hour. And I am so angry that it doesn't go longer. I could listen to those writers go on forever. Anyway. So he says he shot, and this is paraphrasing. He's, he's noting he shot 42%. This is Joe Harris from three last year. And if he regresses to say 39%, he's a massively diff different player. Now, the response is, and the, the reason I know you brought this up, Brian, is because this relates to a point we made on Donovan Mitchell, which I'll recap in a second here. The Reddit poster says, now, is it just me or is that not hyperbolic? Last year, Harris took 4.6 threes in 25 minutes of a game, making 1.9 of them for 42%. Through 78 games, that was 150 out of 358. If he shot 39% instead, he'd have made 140 out of 358 or 10 fewer threes over the season. So he'd have missed one extra three-point approximately every eight games. Now, here's what's funny. This is what I loved and what I wrote down, I think, in, in our chat. I'm going to maybe try and see if I can do it. So here's what I wrote, Brian. I said, this is awesome because this person has the same kind of details I had with a different conclusion. So if you recall last, last week what I was saying is I was bashing Donovan Mitchell. Let, let's do a tutorial for those that have forgotten how to use the Box Score Geeks. So if you go to Box Score Geeks, 
on the top right there is a button called Tools that'll take you to the Players Comparison Engine. And the good news is I want to talk about Donovan Mitchell in 2018, so you just type in Donovan Mitchell and hit Enter. And then you have to click the Efficiency tab. Dear God, Brian, I want to remake this tool so bad, and in 10 years, maybe it'll happen. Okay, so if we look at Donovan Mitchell, Donovan Mitchell shot 34% from three last season. The reason that was bad, according to us, is that the average wing shot 36.8% from three. So basically, he was shooting below average. And if we aggregated everything that's two-point shooting efficiency, three-point shooting efficiency, free throws— his true shooting percentage was 54.1% versus the average wing, which is 55.1%. So essentially, we're saying, and actually I do need to calculate this, Brian, but I, I think if Donovan Mitchell shot average from three-point range, 36.8%, I think we'd think he was above an above-average NBA player. And for, and for what it's worth, we thought he was close to an average rookie. It's like slightly below average for a rookie, but, you know, rookies aren't good traditionally. So I think if he had done that, he would go he would go up to above average for an NBA player, and then I believe that would put him as average for a rookie. To the exact same point this person just said, though, Donovan Mitchell took seven three three-point attempts a game. And so at seven three-point attempts a game, you're talking 2.8%. I'm actually just going to do that. I really need to get a like real calculator or a TI calculator or something, Brian. Or to the very same point that person made, that's 0.2% threes a game that he makes extra, which comes to an additional three every five games. So this was, by the way, a point brought up. I, I don't have it in front of me, but in the wages of wins, I believe they were talking about Ty Cobb versus another player. Ty Cobb, as many know, I think was the last player to get above 400 in baseball as a batting average. And this other player, you know, only hits like 370. So Ty Cobb hits 400 this other player hits 370 who's better obviously ty cobb and, and you just have to go to yourself well wait a minute that's just an additional three hits per 100 at bat like obviously it's a huge difference but you have to see 100 at bats that's 20 games so you have to watch 20 games and see three hits and i noted that last week about donovan mitchell and why it actually makes a lot of sense why people are confused at my bashing of him because what i am essentially saying is about once a month because that'd be 15 games I am upset that Donovan Mitchell, actually doing the math now, Brian, I realize is a little bigger than I thought because I said two on last week's show, it'd actually be three. But essentially I'm saying over the course of a month, about 15 games, I'm mad that Donovan Mitchell didn't make three more three-pointers. And think about the absurdity of that. I do not care what anybody who uses the eye test says, the people that say I watch every game. If you are a film room scout, very much uh, like Nick Uren for the, the Golden State Warriors, if you're a film room scout, and your job is to break down the game. And you have like there, there are tools like Synergy Stats. I'm jealous we, that it's not public anymore. But there are tools like Synergy Stats that break down every possession of the game and you can actually watch the film. If you're a person that spends hours doing that, there is a difference. That, that, there's a reason I give so much credit to people like Coach Nick who we're going to talk later in the show. But I see so many damn casual fans that think just because they DVR'd the Lakers game and watched it while they were you know, playing Pokemon Go that, uh, that it means something. And, and that is just not the case. It is so easy to miss those three three-point attempts. And, you know, I, I've had these experiences in games before. I, I had a game where I had really good seats to a Nuggets game, and Corey Brewer was still on the Nuggets. And it, to me, it seemed like Corey Brewer had a really good game. Uh, and then when I went home and looked at the stats, he shot like 51% true shooting. Uh, I'm, and that's not exact, by the way, so whatever. But I'm just saying, during the game, you turn your head for a second to order a beer, and you miss a, you miss a missed shot or a made shot. You know, you you look down at the scores, you know, they hand out score sheets. If you're watching the game, there are times where you miss plays just because of the camera operator, right? You know, you're not guaranteed that ESPN or NBA TV or whoever doesn't sometimes have a weird camera angle. You know, they're focusing on a kiss cam and they miss a shot. So the eye test really fails here, but that's the key. It is really important. And, and I believe you noted another, and I, I'm just going to give the shout outs. And, you know, if you want to read this thread, people, because we're kind of giving a holistic view of it. I'm just going to be clear that I have not dug deep into the math, so I'm not – I'm neither – you know, this is the retweets are not endorsements. I, I'm not behind anybody 100 percent. I'm in favor of the general vibe of this Reddit uh, – of some of the comments this Reddit thread. But there was a commenter that said from Kay Santi who said, a three-point drop and three-point percentage for Joe Harris can pretty reasonably be argued to be a 32 percent drop in his value as a player. Now, I can't quite agree with it, but the key is – 
that 3% difference would be huge. And that's, we, we've had notes just like this. So we're on the side of Danny LaRue here where there are players where you look at them. A good example, by the way, a hilarious example, by the way, was Steph Curry right before his unanimous MVP. Because if you, uh, let's, let's do this for fun, Brian. If you go to uh, players and let's just look at Steph Curry and just look at his career. So you can just do players, type in Steph Curry, Stephen Curry. And then if you click on Stephen Curry, you'll see his career. So here's what I love. We, we have always been a huge fan of Stephen Curry. I think we thought he was either rookie of the year or second place. By his fourth season for the Golden State Warriors, we thought he was a Brian Starr. That's 200 wins produced, 200 wins per 48. And it produced 12.8 wins. Now, the next season, he does a jump to 16.3 wins produced, 27.6. And then the next season, he does an even bigger jump, not a bigger jump, but another jump. He jumps to 348 wins per 48, 18.9 wins. It actually is a huge jump. I just didn't realize he, he missed more games. After that season, it is completely reasonable to say, I expect some regression to the mean with, with Steph Curry, and so I wouldn't be as high on next season. And so if you see a player like Joe Harris, and so let, let's, let's look into what Danny LaRue is talking about, because you said you're a big Joe Harris fan. Oh, yeah. We mentioned his new contract on the show when he signed it a few weeks ago, and yeah, he looks good. He looks really good. He's a terrifying one to me in that he was... Horrible his first two seasons, but admittedly, this is kind of a weird one. He didn't really play his first two seasons. That was on Cleveland, too. And Brooklyn, his first season was okay. Last season, yeah, he was he was absolutely great. But let, let's be fair, and we, we've noted things like this before. 63.4% true shooting. That is Kevin Durant levels. That's Steph Curry level. So if Danny LaRue is saying, one, I don't know if as a starter, which that that's a fair point, by the way. I, I This is a, a fun question i i would love to look at which is you know strength of competition not not quite on off I, i'm not a fan of on off but it is fair to say that if you're a backup you may not play the same level as competition as a starter which by the way is one of the reasons we actually think the strategy of having a sixth man general a la andre Iguodala, manu ginobili lamar odom all three fantastic players all on championship squads mind you we don't think that's a bad strategy because it's just impossible to keep the same level of competition you know you you, you can't do the NCAA route of having two starting fives that are both, you know, playoff worthy teams, you know, you, you have a weaker bench. So the idea that against starters with more minutes, he might regress. That is a fantastic point. And to the Donovan Mitchell point we made last week, we fully agree that it matters a lot. So, so we're on the side of it. And so the, the take I had, as I said, they came away with the, they came away with the, the take, this is really important or this is really hard to measure, so is it really that important? That's their take, right? Yeah. We only see two, we only see one made three every eight games. Does that matter a lot? Yes. Are you effing kidding me? I mean, if you go to the betting lines for, for NBA game, actually the, the easiest one is SRS, right, Brian? That's the stat we use. So as a reminder, SRS is strength of schedule adjusted point margin. And what that means is that is the margin of victory I would be expected to have in a 100 possession game against a team on an average on a on a neutral court is 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 how that that metric uh boils down. And so here's a key though. So they they said one three every eight games. So if you take three points, divide it by eight, whatever that is. And actually well, you know it's funny, you can just type that into Google and it'll tell you. So that's that's three point that's zero point three seven five points. So as a perspective 0.375 points is the difference between the Utah Jazz and the Philadelphia 76ers last year. The difference between the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Boston Celtics. The difference between the Spurs and almost the Timberwolves. Like, this is a rank or two in NBA standings. Just that. Just what they're saying. So that's the hilarious part. He says, is one three every eight games really that big of a difference? And the answer is, yeah, it's the difference between the fit, the fourth and fifth best team in the NBA last season, which at times, depending on your conference, depending on your division, that's a seed in the playoffs. So that was the funny part is they were like, this is really hard to measure. Is, that, is it really that important versus the take we had last week, which is to say this is really important, but it's really hard to measure. And that explains why so many people miss it. Yeah, that's right. And um, well, so what, what made me think of this thread was your talk at the analytics conference about free throws, right? And you made this exact same point about the free throws. And so 
the and <laughs> I love what you just said though because this guy who has this again title we don't like that says fetishes three point percentage his conclusion is basically that 10 extra three pointers a year doesn't matter and that's just wrong right the gravity doesn't matter none of that i mean it could matter but it doesn't in this case right because even if you just ignore it 10 extra three pointers a year is very significant well let's let's talk about that point too so I want to discuss this concept called gravity, which is funny because I'm going to agree and simultaneously disagree with it. So the concept of gravity is namely, in basketball, if you're a player that can score, when you're on offense, the defense has to be drawn to you, which makes a lot of sense, right? If Steph Curry has the ball, first off, you can't leave him uncovered because he's just going to score. So a player has to be drawn to Steph Curry, sometimes double team, right? If, if, if Steph Curry is near the three-point line, you might want to double cover. That's, that's just common. And you as a Warriors fan, I know you're a big fan of it because what often happens, this this is the premise of gravity. Steph Curry has the ball near the three. Oh my God, the, the defense freaks out. One guy runs at Steph Curry with his arm up. Another player maybe rolls off of his player to make sure that Steph Curry can't drive because Steph Curry is really, Steph Curry is amazing. Steph Curry and Chris Paul are two players that can score. You know, I hate that term at will for players like Carmelo Anthony where you go, if they can score at will, then why don't they? But players like Steph Curry, you look at their shot judge and like, holy cow, this guy can score from anywhere. So, you know, one guy runs at Steph Curry, another guy sags off his guy a little to make sure Steph Curry can't drive. And Steph Curry either takes the shot because he's open or passes off to um, to an, a teammate. One of my favorite anecdotes on this, Brian, is the game where he was going for the record of most made threes in a season. Uh, I think he already had it, but I think he was going for like over 400. Uh, there was a, a possession where he got covered and he passed it to a wide open Draymond Green on the three. And of course, Draymond Green took it. And the announcer was like, why didn't Draymond Green pass the ball back to Steph Curry so Steph Curry could take the three, even though Steph Curry did exactly what we wanted. So that's the concept of gravity. You, you force the opposition to be drawn to. Now, what I love about this too, right, is people are starting to change it the other way where they're saying players like Rudy Gobert also have gravity because if they're near the hoop, then the defense is drawn to them and three-pointers are opened up. It's almost as if, Brian, if you're a player that can score really well in the NBA, the defense has to worry about you and it doesn't really matter where you score from as long as you can score. You heard it here first. So that's the concept of gravity. This this post, some of the people are getting to the argument of saying, well, you know, the, the value of Joe Harris is his gravity. The fact that when he's on the court, the defense is going to have to adjust to him. And, and that, that is, there is something to that, by the way, I, I will actually, what, what's funny, Brian, is there are a lot of concepts in the NBA, things like the usage curve and gravity and, you know, spreading the floor and all that, that I agree with, I agree with to a point, but then disagree with how it's used, if that makes any sense. So I'm saying the players like Dirk Nowitzki are valuable because they can score from anywhere. And that means that the defense has to adjust for him. Which, and, and, and then they do things. Dirk Nowitzki in his prime, Steve Nash in his prime would pass the ball. So I would agree with this premise of a player that can score and the defense has to worry about them. And if they don't, then it, it just makes the offense better. I, I agree with that premise. Uh, uh, LeBron James is one of my favorite examples. He, he was a genius at it. LeBron James would just drive at the hoop. And either he'd end up one-on-one, -on -one, and if he's one-on-one -on -one driving at the hoop, he can take you. Or if they double-teamed him, he would kick the ball out to the open three-man, and he was just great at this. That's gravity. So I agree with that premise. What I don't agree with is this idea that the defense gives a damn about 42% versus 39%, because that's what people are saying. They're saying, does it really matter if Joe Harris, his, his efficiency goes down? Which, which it might, because you know last year might have been an outlier. He might be facing harder competition now. There are lots of reasons to suspect that Joe Harris's shooting efficiency might go down next season and he might not be as good of a player. There, there's a hard bit of calculus to do, though, which is, you know, he only played 2,000 minutes last season. And let's take a look real quick, Brian. I'm going to go to basketball reference. Something I wish we had, Brian, was a starter. There, there's so much I'd love to do on the site, Brian. <laughs> Just to be honest to the listeners, like, it, it may or may not ever happen. It's one of those where we, we're especially happy that sites like basketball reference exist. And, you know, there, there are things we're aiming for, but we may never get there. Okay, so anyway, Joe Harris only started 14 games last season. So there, there is a lot to believe about the fact that if he plays against starters or plays more minutes, his, or last year was an outlier, that, it, that his shooting efficiency might go down. But if you're arguing the value of Joe Harris is that he forces the defense to focus on him and that helps the offense out, I don't think it matters worth a damn if it's 42 versus 39. In fact, 
the exact original poster on calling this like a masturbatory exercise by analysts noted the same thing. That's one three-pointer every eight games. And if you look at that, there is no way the defense can differentiate it. The place I will give credit to Gravity, and I hate to do this, Brian, because he is one of our favorite players, is Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons took a grand total of 11 threes last season, connecting on zero of them, was a, a subject of a lot of ridicule on Twitter. Now, by the box score geek's logic, we're fine with that because what we basically say is if you are below average at a skill, then not doing that skill in a team sport where others are allowed to take that skill because, you know, it, it is worth noting that last year the 76ers were a better offense than, for instance, the Utah Jazz. And one of the skills that Ben Simmons excels at is passing the ball, and that team does have players that can shoot threes. In fact, I know Joel Embiid was basically saying he doesn't like taking threes because he's a big, but, you know, the funny thing is, you look at his numbers, I think Joel Embiid can connect on threes. So if Ben Simmons can pass to players like J.J. Redick or Marco Bellinelli or or even Joel Embiid, he doesn't need to take threes. He's got a, he's got teammates that can fill that gap. This is the Brian Bins of productivity. When I look at a... I don't say what they're good or bad at. In fact, what I'll say oftentimes is if a player is bad at something and they do it too much, that's where I have to worry about cutting the cord even if they're good at other skills. It's, it's, it's um, not quite the Clay Thompson point, but the, the issue with Clay Thompson is Clay Thompson is a phenomenal scorer and probably a pretty decent, I'll say, perimeter defender when we are talking about impacting opponent shooting efficiency. Those are his two skills, and those probably make him a good player. Because he has those two skills, we have no problem with him being a starter. In fact, we think it's great he's being a starter. We don't think he's worth max money, and that's uh, a cause for concern coming up with the Warriors because he's going to want max money, and they really shouldn't give it to him. His dad just said he expects to spend his career on the Warriors, so I think we know what (laughs) Clay's family wants. Yeah, sure. But I mean, that's also, I mean, it's a nice, nego- that, that's also a nice negotiating tactic. You want to yeah. start playing teams against each other really quickly. But the point being, if you look at Clay's other skills, his passing, his rebounding, all of his other stats, they're below average. And you can start saying, if Clay wasn't as good as he was at scoring and, and the Warriors perimeter defense wasn't as good as it is, then you might not want Clay on the court, despite the fact that he's good at that. So it's funny where we'll go the opposite way, where we'll say, if you're bad at something, not only should you not do it, if you do it too much, we actually think it's a detriment. And in fact, like that's one of the reasons we always think, jo- we, we've thought so far Joel Embiid is overrated and thought that so far in his career, DeMarcus Cousins are overrated because they are fantastic at a lot of things people think they are fantastic at, but both of them foul too much and turn the ball over too much. And the good news is, aggregate-wise, they both are above-average players in spite of that, but we're saying that's a big enough ding where we knock them off of that you know, elite tier. So that being said, on on... Back to Ben Simmons. We think he shouldn't do it if he can't. But in terms of gravity, if he took enough threes to just convince the opponent that he would take a three, now he has gravity because they can't tell the difference between a 32% three-point shooter and a 40% three-point shooter. That, that, that's, what, that's, what, that's what me about Donovan Mitchell last week was about. That's what this post is about. So in, in regards to gravity, what I will actually agree with is If a player at least looks like they can score a three such that the opponent won't leave them alone, they'll have gravity and that's all you need. As soon as you've hit that point, it's very binary. As soon as the opponent thinks this player can make this shot if I leave them alone, so I can't leave them alone, the job of gravity is done and you are, you, you cease to have to worry about gravity. And so that's what's amusing me in this post is that the argument really should be what is the trade-off? So this is this is why this is a hard mental exercise, Brian. And I I, I can't even uh, like I think it's K Santi I believe is what you said the username was. Uh, I first off I didn't have time to really review and I don't really want to. I'll be honest. And Reddit was a little bit flaky today, so it was tough to load the page in your defense as well. Yeah. I was trying to read pre-show and couldn't get to it. But then what I'll also say is here here is the full algebra that you have to calculate and this by the way will relate to this is a perfect segue brian because i'll let us jump to our next point i'll let you finish up and then we'll jump to our next point but we're going to talk about why it's hard to predict the nba upcoming nba season and joe harris joe harris's threes are a great example because if you're looking at the impact of joe harris's three-point shooting efficiency well you're going to have to ask a few questions one how many threes is he taking a game so 
he th- this is this is any chart on shooting efficiency. This is the idea of the usage curve, but I'll give it more to the like cutoff curve. Joe Harris can be less efficient from three if he takes more threes and those threes are replacing worse shots. So this is a very like, simple example, right? It might be better for the Utah Jazz's offense for Donovan Mitchell to take a 34% three than what would have happened otherwise. So you can improve your offense. This is like standard economics, right? Like the, I think it's what utilities of scale, economies of scale, something like this idea of like if the United States can produce apples and bananas better than anybody else, but it makes more sense for them to focus on apples in another country to focus on bananas. You're, that is you're like, economies of scale, yeah. Boom! My uh, yeah, good job, Dre. <laughs> I, I was gonna say I had a I had a meeting with a high school uh, economics uh, teacher, and I was so proud of myself because I thought I had used a phrase correctly in class. It was uh, like inelastic demand, and yeah. I was telling a story about how I'd used inelastic demand correctly in class, and he looked at me and was like, "No, that's that's not what that means." So I was like, "Oh man, I I didn't." <laughs> So good. I, I apparently got economies of scale right. But so, so this point in basketball, right? There can be a case where if Joe Harris takes more threes at a worse percentage, but overall it improves the team's shooting efficiency, it's the right maneuver. So when we're trying to argue in a vacuum, and that's, that is what I find so hard about player evaluations, particularly in two realms, defense and shooting efficiency, where people are trying to say this player is good or bad. And they'll ignore their own arguments about gravity and floor spacing because what you really have to ask yourself next season for the Brooklyn Nets is how are they going to allocate their shots? And if they allocate them correctly, they could be a better or worse team. And the answer just very simply is we don't know. But to answer this person's point where they're saying is Daniel LaRue overreacting to saying a three-point shooting efficiency difference is a big deal? No, he's not. That is a big deal. Yep. So, yeah, that's where we fall on that. Okay, I got a few things to close this out. One is that I should say that's just a part of economies of scale, what you said. What economies of scale means is that as you start producing more and more, it becomes less efficient, right? So in your example, different countries are going to be better at scaling than others and should you know, emphasize that, right? So, so that's one thing. And then from what you're saying before that, um, you know, mostly we're just being pundits, you know, talking trash on this show but we every once in a while we do have kind of you know moments of clarity i think and for me one of those was um one of the times we had paul shirley on and he was talking about basically what it's like to be uh you know a high level athlete and and try to and the mental side of it in the middle of the game right and his point was by the time you're you know a pro player and you're 20 years old or whatever it's it's hard you can't it's hard to change your reactions and your instincts, right? It's just kind of embedded into you. And that's what it made me think of with like the 42% versus 39%, right? If you're out there trying to guard a player on the perimeter, you can't process that difference, but it may not necessarily matter because of that, right? And here's an example I think I mentioned on the show recently too, is um, a great point from the Better Rivals NFL podcast. And what they say is that... um, a play action pass in the NFL these days is a good pass and it's going to, you know, have a better yards per play than a non-play action pass. However, traditionally it's thought that the gravity of a play action pass is due to that fake run, right? If you run a lot to set it up and then all of a sudden you do a play action and try to throw, do the fake that, you know, that's going to help it, right? It turns out that's not true. It you don't need to set up the run to Made to do a play action pass it just kind of works and that's because these players are just reacting right so yeah i take is, the gravity with a grain of salt is all i think we talked about that and i mean th- there's also an interesting point on both the, the the set up the run first and then the idea of you know well kobe bryant has to take those mid-range shots to convince me and I, I was even arguing this the same thing with donovan mitchell or with uh, ben simmons there where it's a where it's a hard game where it's like you have to set it up so they're convinced you'll do it now the the funny thing is though that comes with an inherent trade-off because Ben Simmons, as an example, let's uh, let's go back to him last season because I, I seem to recall he was above average. I think I think the depressing part about Ben Simmons, if I recall, oh yeah, he's he's a Wilt Chamberlain, like <laughs> to shoot free throws. Like this is like Ben Simmons and Wilt Chamberlain are like two players because 
Ben Simmons has a 55.1 effective field goal percentage. And whenever you see this, that's like, um, I'll, I'll put this in like DFS terms. It's like when you see both of your pitchers got like complete game shutouts and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to make money tonight. And then you, you, you look at Ben Simmons' free throw percentage and that's like all of your batters getting zeros. It's, 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 it's so depressing to have a 55.1% effective field goal percentage and end with a 55.7 true shooting percentage, which is when you factor in free throws. So He basically shot the same from two-pointer that he did from free throw. It was It's so depressing. Now, the good news, by the way, in the playoffs, he got up to 70% from free throw, which is awesome. But then, of course, he, he dropped down to, uh, let's see if I can find it, something bad. It's, yeah, they don't have effective field goal and an easy, oh, 48.8. So, Unfortunately, he he dropped off in the playoffs in the wrong direction. Admittedly, stronger competition. I think the Celtics are really good. Okay. But uh, I have an idea. If, if you're going to take a shot to convince the pl- opposing players you have gravity and it's below average, that comes with a cost. And it's it's not hard, right? If I if, – if, if average – if um, – let's see. So average true shooting in the NBA I think was like 55.6%. I think if you – I'm trying to recall the exact threshold, but it's 35 points. On, it's 34 or 35%, Brian, from three. You have to shoot 35 or 34% from three, somewhere in that range. I'll try and remember the calculus at some point to be equal to that true shooting efficiency. And right. if you turn fouls, something, but whatever. Point being – if I shoot below 55.6%, if that, is, that is the net effect of a shot I take, then my team has to not only be above, not only be average, they have to be above average to make up for it. So like if I, if, to put it in more simple terms, if 50% was average, if I took a 45% shot to just get myself back to average, my team now has to get a 55% shot. And so that's the funny thing is that if people are saying you space the floor well, what what very simply happens with players like Russell Westbrook and Carmelo Anthony and towards the end of his career, Kobe Bryant, is you just run out of time. If that player takes 30 shots and you get 90 shots in a game, that means you have to take thir- not just 30 above average shots, 30 way above average shots just to get yourself to average to be worth it. And, and like I think your play action point, I'm convinced it does not have to be a one-to-one. If Ben Simmons takes two threes a game at 32%. That is probably sufficient enough to get gravity such that he doesn't have to worry about it. So when you see a player like Carmelo Anthony take five to 10 mid-range jumpers and you say he has to do that to conv- to keep the defense honest, it's like, no, if he makes two of those a game, the, the, the their reaction, like you're saying, right? Their reaction will come to him. It's only when you have players that don't do anything. I mean, Razan Rana, that, that's part of his game. He actually did develop a three-point shot because they used to just sag off him on the deep now he shoots threes, and I mean, I think he he has aged tremendously well. I think he's one of the most underrated players out there. So, I, I think in the gravity discussion, you're and the play action discussion, you're you're right. Where I think people overrate the value of just volume shooting for the sake of volume shooting. Yeah, and just to finish up on that, of course, the NFL and NBA are different, so maybe that's a bad analogy. I don't know, but conceptually, it makes sense to me. And so I'm going to try to do some homework myself and go back and read what people have written about gravity because, you know, the way we're the way you're portraying it here is basically it's a binary one or a zero. Right. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Either you recognize the player can do this one play or not. But if people tried to quantify it and say, well, players have this much gravity, I don't know. That's where it starts getting sketchy to me. So to be continued on gravity, as far as I'm concerned. What, I, what I'd argue a simple argument you have to have on gravity, too, is the player has to be able to pass. That's why we like play. <laughs> That's why we love him. He was great at passing. And we were like, yeah. why? Is, like his gravity is great. And part of the reason his gravity is great, he's actually willing to uh, give up the ball. If you view gravity just as how much does the defense react, but you don't factor in, well, do they actually take advantage of it? To me, it seems st- stupid. I mean, that would be like looking at a player that, you know, consistently got two balls before anything, but then they always struck out because, you know, they didn't take advantage. They didn't work the count. And I also point out one last thing on Ben Simmons. He also gets turnovers down, too. Yes. Well, I mean, the good news, I mean, this is what Patrick always says and why the 76ers should feel in good shape. Turnovers tend to be a very rookieish thing that you just kind of learn. Both yep. Embiid and Simmons have, you know, basically between the two of them about about a year and a half worth of experience. So it's like if they both just get those under control, standard aging makes the 76ers very scary. And I still argue, by the way, just to recap a point we've made on the 76ers before, if you're happy about the 70, how the 76ers have done, you should be infuriated because for F sakes, the Colangelos are one of the worst dynasties or whatever you want to call them because it's a father-son 
to having control of a franchise. I mean, just look at how Toronto did after them in the hands of a co- – if you look at how Toronto did in the hands of a competent GM after what the Colangelos did, think about what the 76ers could be doing in the hands of a competent GM right now. All right, let's go to over-unders. Uh, I'm going to be – I'm using a site, and uh, as Brian notes, it'll, it'll the, the URL will be on there. I actually want to give uh, a negative thing. I wouldn't recommend using this site legit. Don't, don't put any bets on this site. Uh, one season a few years back, just for fun, I went to a site like this and was like, ah, just for fun, I want to put, I think I wanted to bet 100 bucks across all 30 NBA teams. So some very boring bets. And I said I was going to bet $100 to prove some of our preseason predictions. And I bet on the site, and you know, I think I made five bucks, and I tried to cash out, and they were like, it took them a month to get back to me. And then when they finally cashed out, they sent me a check and said, you know, not to say anything, we're at the bank. So it's just the United States gambling situation is getting much better and I'm very excited for it. So like you don't have to use sketchy internet sites. We're just using it to be able to look at the odds quickly because I don't have access to like a Vegas sports book. All right. I'm going to like lightning round that. That's how we discussed this pre-show, Brian. It's going to be like a quiz show. So some of these I'm just going to pass. Some of these I'm going to say, I don't know. I don't care. And we're just going to go alphabetical order because that's how they have it listed on the site. And this is regular season wins according to a sports book out there. I did advertise on a lot of podcasts, which is what, which was like what depressed me too, Brian. As I was like, I'd hear a podcast advertisement, I was like, don't put your money on that site. They're sketch, and so we'll never be one of those podcasts. So the Atlanta Hawks have an over under of twenty three point five wins. I'm just going to say pass on this. They were a bad team last season, and one of the annoying parts about the NBA is the following: um, when a team is bad, everybody knows there's tanking involved in the NBA. We 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 we. we talked till we're blue in the face about why it's a bad strategy but that does not you know it's 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 just because we say something is illogical doesn't mean teams don't still do it so as soon as you have a bad team you have no idea what they're going to do they were a 24 win team last season but i believe they gave up some good players or whatever in the off season who knows and you know if they're tanking towards the end of the season so i i think they have not done anything to really push them out of that lottery realm they're going they're probably going to be a competing for the draft lottery and as a result i don't know so i'm not going to touch them next team boston celtics over is 58 wins now here is something traditional about the box score geeks brian the boston celtics always screw us because we are always pessimistic on the boston celtics so with that anecdote in mind i say bet the over for the love of god bet the over but from a more clinical analytics side what i would say is this one I wouldn't want to touch, that, that I'll be clear. But I'm going to put them in very much the same category as the Golden State Warriors. Both Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving are coming back from injury, season-ending injury. And that, those are the rough ones, right? We have no idea how they're going to look. Um, Al Horford looked amazing last season. Yeah. And, and he's old. I mean, just that that's a simple fact. That's what I'm worried about, Trey. They're thin up front. If Horford doesn't go crazy like he did last season again and one of their bigs gets hurt, they could have some issues. They also have some issues. I mean, you know, we noted, I think they picked up, uh, which which of the Morris? Was it Marcus Morris? <laughs> so they have a bad, same problem, right? Not only do they are they weak up front, they have some bad players off the bench if their good players get injured. And then a lot of their talent, it, it's great, but it's redundant. You know, you've got players like Terry Rozier, Jason Tatum, um, Jason, uh, Jalen Brown. There we go. You have a bunch of good players like that that are somewhat, you know, redundant on position. So it's kind of like this team did really well last season without Gordon Hayward, but that's because you had Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Well, if Gordon Hayward comes back, you're going to lose some of the minutes. Same with Kyrie Irving. So it's like, I will say, and then they also lost Greg Monroe, who was decent. So it's kind of like, I, I'm, worried about this team enough so that i'll say this team if everything goes well is easily in the 60s this team if some things go badly is in the 40s it's a it's high enough variance where i don't want to touch it yeah this roster has so much talent and maybe even more than last year but it's all on the wings now the next team uh brooklyn nets over under 32 and a half wins this is an annoying one, Brian. Same boat as the Celtics, where I, I, I don't want to touch it because of high variance. We have loved some of their moves. They've they picked up some good players. Uh, didn't they? Did they get Fareed from the Nuggets, I seem to recall? I can't remember where Fareed ended up. I think he did end up there, though, and also Ed Davis as well in free agency. Let's confirm that. But, um, yeah, I mean, the Nets could, in theory, go over on this, but it's kind of a high variance situation. I can't remember. I think Jeremy Lin's been beat up. I don't know if he's um, if he'll be back or whatever. So it's kind of yeah, like this is not a well-researched segment <laughs> to our well, listening no. audiences. You can tell. I, I don't. I don't. Well, again, 
we said this last week, so we'll do a quick recap, like lightning round recap. We think preseason predictions are dumb. And like that exact entire argument about Joe freaking Harris's three point shooting efficiency shows why. Because yeah. people are arguing on Reddit. Does one free what well, does one made three over eight games really matter? And we look and go, are you fucking kidding me? Yes. And because of that, and but then I follow that up with here is the mental calculus to figure out how much it matters and what looks and who does what and da 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 da. And that's just really hard on its own. Before we get into what we talked about last week. Minutes matter a lot. Who the coach is going to play, we have no idea. Which players are going to start breaking down? We just mentioned Al Horford on the uh, the the Celtics. He's a prime candidate to break down, but we have no idea how how he's going to deteriorate. And players do not in the NBA. Players do not ramp up or break down and predict it. They don't do it smoothly in predictable fashion. That's the problem. Basically, they kind of have an expiration date where they just it's like a, a the best way to describe a lot of franchise players decline is a dead cat bounce. They basically get a lot worse, look a little better, get a lot worse, and they're done. That That's how most players. So th- there's no really, really to predict that. The same with young players. Ben Simmons, Jason Tatum last season, they broke out. That That's amazing for rookies. We don't see that happen a lot. There are some second, third-year players next season that are going to look fantastic. There are some players, you know, a lot of play- people, myself included, are really high in Nikola Jokic. Because we think he's going to get more minutes. He got that big contract. He's slimmed up in the offseason, allegedly. So some players are going to break out, and we have no idea. So when I'm doing this segment, and I'm saying, you know, I first off, you're like, it's not well researched. Like, you're damn right it's not, because yeah. I'm going back and forth already. And if I well researched it, the if I was honest with ourselves, and this was a problem that became very obvious. We had like error bars around our prediction at the box score geeks when we first started around preseason predictions. We did this for every team in the NBA. We calculated their minutes played, their expected production, how many wins we thought they'd get, what their odds of, you know, winning the, you know, of winning the division was. And our error bars just seemed really off to me. And after a while, I was like, yeah, we we cannot do this within a in in in, a, in an error bars fashion that I'm happy with. And so the way I approach this is that if someone listening were to want to bet on one of these teams, what I want to tell them is here are the things you should consider if you're going to bet on these teams. Here are the most important parts of this team. Yeah. And so and so what's funny is our first four, basically the of the first four, I would say I'm I'm leaning towards saying bet the under on the Celtics, but I wouldn't be happy about it. And the other three, Atlanta, Brooklyn, Charlotte, none of those. And I, we're going to get to Charlotte next. Charlotte Bobcats, Charlotte Hornets, stupid Hornets. Over-under is 35 and a half. I'm tempted to say the under because they lost Dwight Howard and he played last season. And also I think Batum's on the block. But they also have some good players that underperformed. This team is also depressing to me in that they, they have a real big piece of kryptonite who is a former UW Madison Badger. Uh, Frank Kaminsky, he he has no business being a starter in the NBA, and he's a starter for a team. He's very Melo and Kaminsky last season le- legitimately dropped a team a peg. The Charlotte Hornets are a playoff team. If you take Kaminsky and replace them with the my sarcastic jibe replacement level player, the um, Oklahoma City Thunder are a contender. If you replace Melo with a replacement level player, so in that regard, uh, the Charlotte Hornets. I mean, I think. Yeah, it's good enough for me to not want to touch it because I think the under is probably not wrong, but there's enough stuff that could cause them to go over. I'm going to be boring, Brian. Chicago Bulls over under 29. Yeah, I mean, the the funny thing about a lot of these teams in the lottery range is that you have no idea. And then also when the season's over, it's remarkable how many of these teams look like worse teams than they did on paper. So that's what makes it even harder is like if you think they're better than a 29 win team, but they're at 24 wins with 10 games to play in the NBA season and it's over. It's odd that they might lose one or two close games. So is what it is. Uh, Cleveland Cavaliers over under 30 and a half. Here's a funny one, Brian. I wouldn't put any money on it. But uh, this team is a is a freaking train wreck um, with all the bad contracts and players they have. Tristan Thompson and Kevin Love, we love both of them, but they both have injury and off the court issues. I have no, I don't want to touch it. I'll put it that way, but I'm leaning towards the under. And by the way, I'll, I'll try and give a pregnant pause after each if you want to jump in, if you disagree. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay on the uh, Cavaliers. I think uh, they still have Larry Nance as well. They were kind of glutted, you know, in the front court last year. So now with LeBron gone, they can give some of their other, you know, good players in there. 
you know, I'm not sure they'll make the playoffs, but they, they might. And 30 wins, I think, is doable for them. The problem is, though, like you said, injuries are an issue. I think I'm inclined to say... And I like the under on the Bulls, but yeah, let's keep moving. Oh, yeah. you like the under? Yeah, because they're, they're not yeah. a good... I think it's well-placed. I think the, the 34 and a half is, is a well-placed one for the Mavericks. But I think there is upside to the over. Uh, we absolutely love, love, love um, DeAndre Jordan, and they picked him up. If Luka Doncic is an above-average rookie, that could be good. The good news about Dirk Nowitzki is they signed him to a one-year, $5 million deal, and he didn't play a lot of minutes and was above-average last season. Um, we like Salah Mejri. I think I think they're weak, but I think the good news is they're improved from last year. You know, we, we, we'd we almost say that uh, DeAndre Jordan on his own might be worth that 10 wins to get them in that over, and then a few things bounce the right way. So I wouldn't, you know, with, here's what's a funny point, Brian. It's almost as if the odds makers for this thing are, are pretty good at placing it to, to make it seem like either side is a good idea. Uh, I lean towards the over on the Dallas Mavericks, but again, don't want to touch this. Now, finally, Brian, finally, 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 I can have a hot take. Are you fucking kidding me on the Denver Nuggets at 47 and a half over under? Take the over, you know, <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Now, the annoying part about taking any over, and we've mentioned this before in the NBA, is because the NBA is a star-driven league, it just takes a few tweaks to a star. I mean, last season, that that's what did it. The, the over on the Warriors last season probably seemed like a wise pick if it was 60 and you would have missed the over under at 60 and it wasn't 60 for what it's worth but i'm saying the over under for the warriors last season at 60 would have been an easy easy bet and they didn't hit it but that's because they missed over 50 games out of their starting core including multiple occasions of all of them being out so that's the problem that the reason i'm so freaking high on the denver nuggets is they have nikola Jokic, who is freaking amazing and he got signed to a big contract, and it looks like they're finally going to let him out, as in give him more minutes, which he should. They also got rid of some bad players. They got rid of Dara, Daryl Arthur and Wilson Chandler, two players that have just I've hated forever. Um, I'm a little sad that they let Kenneth Fareed go, but he wasn't getting minutes. And last season, they won 46 minutes, 46 games without him. So the starting core of Jamal Murray, Gary Harris, I would say Will Barton, now, it gets rough. I have no idea, like, um, Paul Millsap might affect some of this, but, you know, if, if they play Mason Plumlee and Nikola Jokic, if they play their best five, they have a great core. They are an improved team significantly from last year just based on age and mm -hmm. after getting rid of some of their bad players. So the Denver Nuggets are an improved team. This I forget how young Jokic is. How old is he now? He's really uh, young still, right? Like he was a set, I think he was like a 19-year-old second-round pick, so I think he's still relatively young i'll look it up uh nikola Jokic is only 22 brian so it'll be 23 wow. you're not look, kidding about age nikola Jokic is 20 years old uh 22 years old jamal murray is 20 years old gary harris is 23 will barton's 27 this team has an amazingly good young core they also you know they also got rid of um freaking emmanuel moody mid-season last season but i'd argue that he'd cost them some wins so it's like they got rid of three bad players they're just going to have standard aging and if Isaiah, you know, Isaiah Thomas is an improvement over Emmanuel Moutier, probably. So I'll give it that. Detroit Pistons over under of 38. Um, seems like taking the over makes sense. They did better than that last season. They've got um, Andre Drummond. I don't see why you wouldn't take the over. Seems easy. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. They added Zaza Pachulia, championship winning player. All right. There you go. It seems uh, like they'll be about the same as last year to me. They have a very similar roster. The Golden State Warriors at 63 and a half. That's perfectly placed. I don't want to touch it. I'd lean. Like I said, I, I think there are enough cracks where it's better. It, there's a good chance that they hit the under. But I don't want to touch it. That That's good place. Because if they're healthy, you know, even without even without uh, DeMarcus Cousins, healthy, that team can hit that. So that's just a good placed one. They basically admitted at points last year that they don't even try really during the regular season. They just kind of coast and turn it on the playoffs. So, yeah, we just – minutes are a tough thing to predict with them. They could, you know, get way ahead and rest players. Players could get injured. It's really hard to hit these big win numbers, especially, you know, with the Popovich school of resting players. Which, which is – I mean – the thing is, and, and last, it's it's kind of funny that you could argue 
that the Rockets, in a way, did him a favor because, you know, we noted Steph Curry was healthy for the playoffs. And that when it became obvious they really couldn't win, you know, the conference, they they didn't try as hard to win the conference and, you know, rested their players better, which, you know, we would argue is the right maneuver. You know, you really do want to make sure that your players are healthy for the season. So in that regard, the Pacers or not Pacers, sorry, the, the Warriors got helped out a little. The Rockets, this is fascinating, Brian. 56 over under because of Mello. <laughs> Because a core of James Harden, Chris Paul, and I think they picked up like um, James Enos, I believe, who played well on the... They no. added Carmelo Anthony, Michael Carter-Williams, Gary Clark, Vincent Edwards, James Zenis, and Isaiah Hartenstein. Or sorry, Hartenstein. Hartenstein. Apologies to Mr. Hartenstein. I, especially like Capella, if he just ages normally. And I... I would hope. So here is I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna regret this, Daryl, because you're in an you're in a, an off season, right? You 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 do good GM moves every other year. This was your bad year. This is where you picked up Melo. I'm gonna buy that they are more the, more willing to pull the plug on Melo quickly than other teams would be. I like I really like the over on this one, but if Melo gets fifteen hundred plus minutes, they're not gonna hit it. But I'm just hoping. One of two things happens. Either Melo does have a turnaround, right? Chris Paul is like, I figured it out. I'm just going to alley-oop you the ball. You're going to score 20 points a game on 10 alley-oops a game. A brilliant D'Antoni strategy. Either that happens or Melo doesn't play well and they bench him. So I'm hoping one of those two scenarios happen. I like the over. I wouldn't touch the bet. The Indiana Pacers over seems pretty easy. I could be crazy. I don't know. Let's see, I mean, they are at 47.5. They were kind of a surprise team last year that we loved the over on and they delivered. Not surprising to us cuz we're so great, but to everyone else. Yeah, so I mean they got they got four they they got 48 wins last season. One of one of the reasons was like Victor Oladipo improved. I am trying I'm trying to think it, what where are you looking by the way for your um for your player movements this season cuz ESPN is <laughs> It it's up. funny. I'm at a site called EspanosNBA.com that I've never heard of, but it has these great in-out tabs on them. So, yeah, could yeah. you do me a favor and just copy that into GChat so I can use it? Because sure. yeah, I'm, I'm trying to use like Spotrack and Basketball Reference, but it's not as ideal as I would like. Yeah, I, I think the overs fine on them. I mean, I I don't have a problem betting it. It's just one of those. Yeah, you know. uh, Los Angeles Clippers. The under seems pretty easy with the loss of DeAndre Jordan. Um, yeah, that's, and that's, that's, that's why I like the over on the Mavericks too. Yeah, I mean, well, what what I'll say is, if you're not, if you don't get out of the lottery, if you don't get out of the lottery range, it's really hard to know what a team is going to do because, yeah, towards the end of the season they might shut things down, they might start trying to put players on the block, but if a player is, but if a team is in the lottery, then it starts, or yeah, if a, if a team's in the lottery, that makes it a little easier. But so the other the other part about that is. Sorry, where was I? Let's get back. Oops. Yeah, while well, well, you're looking that up, I'll talk about the Clippers real fast. I, I mean, if they're, you know, if, again, we're going to say, like, what is the world we're in versus the world we would have wanted to be if we were the GMs, they would have found a way to keep DeAndre Jordan, you know, plan that somehow. But in a world where they have to lose him, it wasn't the biggest disaster in the world. You know, they got Gortat and Mbappe Mute and some decent players. You know, they drafted Shy, who everyone likes, but the West just got so good. Like, all, we're going to be talking about all these other West teams that are improving and where they're kind of staying marginal or going a little bit backwards. Like, yeah, they're it's going to be a tough season for them, even though they're kind of making marginally smart moves. Well, what I'll say is when you fall into the lottery, right, that's what makes it hard for me to want the over. So it's like I do think they fell out of being a playoff team to being a lottery team. And as soon as you do that, like if I think they're close to a 36 win team, um, I, I can buy them dropping below. This pains me. The Los Angeles Lakers, 49 and a half. That is really well placed. I agree. Um, we love, love, love LeBron James. He's our favorite. If this was a funny note, like if um, if Lonzo Ball can just stop shooting the ball like he's from the 60s and shoot like he's in the <laughs> 70s, the Lakers can improve. Um, so, so it's hard to know. I, I, I like where that's placed. I don't want to touch it because I, I easily think they could do better than that. I easily think if there's little regression on like Kyle Kuzma, 
on, on LeBron James, if there's any off the court drama, you know, that there could be some fun stuff there. So I, I yeah, think all it's... those young players are young and will probably improve. Right. And here's one thing though. We, we fall for this all the time too. I know I do anyway, is talking about LeBron, the player versus LeBron, the coach or LeBron, the GM, you know, in theory, and maybe he's a better player than a coach or GM. And people have been hammering LeBron for that when he went to the Lakers. Like, why are you taking this, this group of misfits with you to the Lakers? And I don't really agree with this time. I think I like that LeBron got JaVale McGee and Lance Stevenson, Ray John Rondo. Those are all really good defensive players. And if he's just going to dominate the ball on offense, he's going to need players like that. So I like what they've done in general and their young players. Yeah, I think I think it could go. I mean, it's funny because a lot of these where I think they're well placed, I'm a funnier person because I can see it going either way, like by a large margin. So that's the funny part is if you're like if the season ends and they win 60 games and you're like, you said it was a good place. And I'm like, yeah, because I thought there was an equally good shot of 60 or 40. And I could you they have could nine pre- new players. It's tough to say what will happen. Exactly. Uh, Memphis Grizzlies um, here. Uh, this one, I'm going to have to give a pass, but for a better reason. There is enough moving parts with this team that I have not inspected well enough to know. So I'm just going to say I didn't do my homework, so uh, I'll uh, I'll leave them alone. <laughs> oh man, so I love Javon Carter, who they drafted. He was you know one of the most underrated players in the draft. I think he's hurt though; he might be missing a lot of time. So and he's a rookie, so he's probably not going to matter. They got Kyle Anderson on a great contract, which we love. They got Caspi, who's good. So they made again some okay moves, but. We just take the under on these guys every year because they have so many old, older kind of on the downside players. You know, Mike Conley's still not bad, but he's been hurt a little. I don't think Marcus has anything left in the tank at all. So, yeah, I, I, I'm always down on the Grizzlies until they turn over that core and move on towards Kyle Anderson as being the core. So first up, Brian, I'm going to steal from you and say – hispanosnba.com that's my shout out you are right it's amazing isn't it a good site i like it i'm gonna jump Assuming back it's with, accurate it's good and and just say indiana pacers of course i knew i this is funny because like when we talk like doing your homework like i've looked at all the transactions and then been like i think i seem to recall that the pacers did good they picked up tyreek evans and kyle o'quinn two yeah. players love 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 this such fantastic pickups you add those players to an already 48 win team that was why I, I remember there was a reason i was like yeah, this seems like such an easy over-under that they're going to be better than last season. So I'll, I'll give that to them. Yeah, they could move up into that, you know, that upper five team or so challenging, you know, the Raptors. They could be really good. All right. So the Miami Heat, they think they're going to get worse this year. I, I don't know if I agree. It, it kind of does depend on if Dwayne Wade signs anything and comes back. But they kind of lost some older beat-up players and were a 44-win team last season. A lot of that, what, what I'll say is good about that placement is what is always true, unfortunately, about the Miami Heat is a lot of them rides on the, the health of white side, and we never know. So I, 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 I lean towards the over and then just say it's, it's well-placed. Yeah, and there is, so here's, I have no judgment on the Heat at all because they seem willing to bench white side and not, you know, really play them very many minutes. And I just did a quick look in the news because I'm like, oh, I haven't heard what's going on with Whiteside lately. Well, apparently he's in trade rumors still, so they still just don't have faith in him. And I'm sure he's a difficult personality, but it just looks like the Heat are not going to say he's their franchise guy. All right, so let's get to the Milwaukee Bucks at 47. Um I'm just inclined to agree that they basically spin their wheels and stay in place. So I think that's a well-placed one, but that that's, that should be depressing. I'm, I'm in Wisconsin. To have a player of Giannis Antetokounmpo's skill set for the last three seasons, and in those three seasons not crack 50 wins is criminal, and it does boil down to the fact moves like this, picking up Ursan Ilyasova, picking up Brooke Lopez, <laughs> the team just does not make good non-star moves and the only good star move they made was um uh, was to get um Giannis and I don't even give him much credit so I think I think that's well placed and it just kind of depresses me yeah two this, things on them they'll have Eric Bledsoe for a full season and I think he was dinged up a little bit last year when they got him so he didn't really play that great so I think that's the real question is how's he going to be in like his the full season with them and then another thing is they did let Jabari Parker walk and not pay him like the Bulls wanted to. That was a very smart move by the Bucks. Yeah, but the thing is he didn't play that many minutes for him and then they picked up a player yeah. like 
Lopez. So that's the problem. Is I was like, that's true. Get out, get out of Jabari Parker, and then what do they do? They pick up a player like Brooke Lopez, and this is after they let Greg Monroe walk last season for Eric Bledsoe because they didn't want a scoring big that couldn't play D. So it's, it's all baffling. All right, Minnesota Timberwolves at forty five and a half to me is baffling. They won 47 games last season. That was with uh, Jimmy Butler injured. So I I do wonder if there's any news, because I know Jimmy Butler is allegedly unhappy there. I lean towards the over. It just seems like this team is is better than that squad. I mean, Carl Anthony Towns, Jimmy Butler. uh, Who's their point guard that they got? Um, Well, they have Derek Rose still, but they have Jeff Teague, I think, is their starter. Yeah, Jeff Teague is pretty good. Yeah. Um, I mean, this team is, is you know, those, those three players are good if, if, if Andrew Wiggins can show even a glimpse of improvement. So I, I, I'm ba- I think this is just kind of like people not realizing Jimmy Butler was injured last season. But, if of course, if he's dinged up and doesn't come back, that could be a thing. So Yeah, that's what it is. It's that combined with the, you know, talk of him not being happy and not liking Towns. But then, as we pointed out a few weeks ago, you know, they, the media screwed up like what the team was able to offer him. So that's a big part of it. And, um, yeah, assuming he plays, they should get the over. Oof. Uh, so the New Orleans Pelicans at 45 and a half is a, that's a good one because they won 48 games last season, but that was with DeMarcus Cousins for part of the season. They, um, and he played pretty well. Played pretty well during that time. In the off season, they picked up simultaneously Jaleel Okafor and Julius Randle, and this is this is what we were saying about why preseason predictions are dumb. If you were us, you play Julius Randle and Anthony Davis and just love the fact that the opposing team never gets a rebound. A lot of teams, though, they're going to be like, well, you got to play Jaleel, you got to spread the floor. I easily see this team taking the over. If, if it was gun to my head and I had to take a bet, I'd take the over. I think it's well-placed. There's enough stuff um, to not know. Rondo is a really big loss, uh, bigger than I think people will give it credit for and Alfred Payton's pretty good though. So maybe he can make that up. And one other thing to say though, is last year they outperformed their Pythagorean by quite a bit, if I remember right. So if they play as well as they did last year, they still could lose more games. All right. New York Knicks, um, over under 30. Um, I think it's an easy because they lost Kyle O'Quinn and they didn't pick up anything good. I mean, I'd take the under, I, it, it, it's it's yeah, it's so much easier to say I don't think this team is going to surprise us than to say this team that I think is really good, everything's going to stay good. So I, I like the under. Now I get to have a, one of my other hot takes that I've had over under Oklahoma City Thunder 49 and a half. Oh my God, take the over, take the over. We thought Mello was worth negative four wins on his own. It's worth noting an average player is not worth zero wins. An average player would be worth roughly four to five wins. An average starter in the NBA is worth four to five wins at least. So the Oklahoma City Thunder, they were a 48-win team last season. It's crim- – you know, I mean, I'm trying to remember – I think someone was noting this, that it's kind of really odd about Russell Westbrook in that the season before he wins MVP, you know, we, what I'll say is we don't have a problem with it, right? We, we, we think that it's not a problem for – with how well he played for him to have won MVP for that triple-double season. His performance is good enough. I don't have any complaints. But then the next season, let's see, I'm going to take a quick look here. Definitely had a down year last season. Well, he was worse, but then what I'll say is, oh, yeah, you know, actually, he didn't do that bad. He placed top five, I, yeah. I recently said. I mean, he had a down year, but one of the funny— th- But then what, Steven what, Adams had a career year, too, so I think that kind of balances out. But what I'll say, too, is frustrating about this is you're like, Russell Westbrook didn't play as well, and you're like, well, Mello was a black hole. So <laughs> there, there were assists yeah. that Russell Westbrook would be getting with a better player that he wasn't getting, and Mello was not spacing the floor. So it's kind of like, that's weird to me. But the Oklahoma City Thunder, the over, oh, my goodness, if New Orleans Noel is even semi-healthy, he's such an improvement over Mello. I love the core of this team with uh, Russell Westbrook, uh, Enos Cantor, Steven Adams. This team, uh, Andre well, Cantor, Rope- Cantor's on the Knicks now, but yeah, the point remains. They still have Paul George, right? Jeremy Paul- Grant. Yeah. Apologies. I, yeah. I, it's wishful thinking on my part, part where it should have been, a, <laughs> should have been Cantor instead of Mello. But yeah, okay. So, but yeah, Paul George had a good year last season. I don't think he's a star anymore, but he's certainly a productive player. Russell Westbrook, Robertson, if he's back healthy, Nerlens Noel, if he's healthy, Stephen Adams. I love this core. I love the over. That's such an easy over. Yeah, and, and Robertson's health, I think, is the only question here. But if he comes back, you know, even part of what he was before, they'll be fine. And, you know, like you said, Westbrook, 
we think he'll probably bounce back to the normal Westbrook. But I'll I'll point out another big departure for them in addition to Carmelo Anthony is Corey Brewer. Like between the two of them, that's a lot of bad minutes going out the door. So the, it's the same as the Nuggets, addition by subtraction, yeah. a lot of addition by subtraction. Here's the sad part to me about the Orlando Magic, um, the over-under on them, which is according to sportsbook.ag. Fine, I'll give the URL. (laughs) 31, um, I have no idea in part because looking, I don't see any of the names. It seems like the under is the wise bet because none of the names seem like they matter that I'm reading over. Muhammad Bamba, Isaiah Briscoe, Troy Capian, Melvin Frazier, Jerry and Grant, Emil Jefferson. Gerald, Gerald Martin was good at one point and Timothy Mozgov. I'm not excited about any. They were below that last year. Um, they, they are not impressing me as a team. So, Yeah, they, they seem like a tanking candidate, unfortunately. So one thing is Mo Bamba is a really exciting rookie, especially as a defensive player. So I'll be looking at him. But again, we really expect rookies to contribute, even if they do go on to be stars. Jonathan Isaac gets a lot of hype, and he's a player I want to like, but the numbers just aren't there yet. So eh, not too excited about him. And then the big one is Aaron Gordon, right? I loved Aaron Gordon when he was younger. I don't know if it's been injuries or being played out of position or what, but he's just never really developed into being a good, big, or small player. So, you know, maybe, you know, he's still young enough, but, you know, I'm not not ready to like Orlando at all. Ken Birch, though, a young player, I like him. Philadelphia 76ers, 53 and a half seems perfect. They won 52 games last season. Um, I'm not really that impressed with their offseason moves. You know, they helped us out, like I said, picking up Wilson Chandler from the Nuggets. I think losing uh, Marco Bellinelli um, hurts hurts him a little bit. But I mean, they're still. But then, of course, they lost our son Ilyasova too, who we didn't like. I mean, I think just standard aging with this team. They have got a really good core five. So I think you know, just it, it boils down to health, and that's that they're in a spot where I could easily see them getting the over under. So I don't touch it. Phoenix Suns under 29 and a half. Allegedly, they won the, the draft. I think they picked the best college player. I do not know if they've done enough else to really be worth it, if I recall. Um, well, they got Trevor Reza. They got, oh, but then they got Daryl. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. They got they got some good players. They got some bad players. They lost some good players. I, I They lost Alex Len. My gut check on this team actually is the under. I, I, think, I think they're going to be excited about a rookie. But they let go. Alex Len was a good player, and they let go. You know, and they got some bad players back. Peyton and Dudley weren't bad either. You know, here's my problem: is the players that they. I mean, some of their. I mean, yeah, Aiton is was great in college. Who knows if he'll be good? Reese is fine, but they're kind of existing young core of you know, Dragon Bender, Devin Booker, who they opened, you know, backed up the Brinks trucks for. We're not a big fan of him. Marquise Chris, eh. So they're just they're going to give these young players a ton of minutes, and we don't think they're very good. So seems like another tanking year for the Suns, unfortunately. This is a rough one. The Portland Trail. I always get baffled by teams without major moves, and and you might disagree with me immediately, Brian, on what constitutes a major move. Let's find out. Where they 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 won forty nine wins last season. Their over under is forty two, which seems a little odd to me. Admittedly, according to our numbers, in a mere 1,400 minutes played, Ed Davis was worth eight wins. So, and I don't, but the other thing is, like, for instance, if Nurkic picks up some play, even though it's not as good as Ed Davis, that's still minutes. Eh, I think the over, but, yeah, I think I, I like the over on this one. I, yeah, this is tough. So one thing is Lillard played out of his mind last season, and, you know, he could keep that up. He's He's a really damn good player, but... Yeah, it's just like their moves are, they're kind of meh, and the rest of the roster is kind of meh. We're not big fans of CJ McCollum with a player, all, as a player, although, as you said in recent shows, the pro wrestling heel aspect of the NBA offseason, he has embraced that tremendously, so we're a fan of him for that. But on the court, I don't think it's going to help. Some of their young players like Zach Collins and Caleb Swanigan are interesting, but um, yeah, it just seems like they're going to be struggling for an eighth seed again in the playoffs. All right, Uh, Sacramento Kings over under is 25.5. They won 27 wins last season. I don't see major improvement, but I don't see worse. I think Yogi Ferrell is half decent, so I kind of like the over. But again, it's it's a no. It, it gets so frustrating as soon as you get below thirty win teams because you just have no idea how hard they're going to hit the tank mode or how effectively. That's that's part of the. That's what's stupid stupid frustrating about the NBA. I think I brought this up before, Brian. There's a sketch on 
uh, a, a now canceled show I used to like uh, called Important Things by Dimitri Martin, where they had the like a funny race where it was you had to win the race, but you had to pretend you didn't care. So you couldn't run really hard. So it's a bunch of people like speed walking, but pretending they don't care about it and then doing things like talking to someone to move up ahead. And the winner eventually wins by sneezing over the finish line. So the better tankers are the teams that kind of pretend they they don't want to lose, but really lose. The Sacramento Kings are right in that line, so I think I think it's well placed. Yeah, so the only way they can really take a step up is for one of those young players to take some kind of crazy, you know, Ben Simmons kind of season. They got Bagley, who is a high pick. They still have Collie Stein and Skull and some of these guys, but that's just really unlikely. They're probably just gonna continue to be bad. The uh, San Antonio Spurs over under is at forty. Let me get it correct. Forty five. 45, that is insanity. Now, we we do think, for what it's worth, that the San Antonio Spurs failed in this offseason in that they did not get great return for Kawhi. They let some good players like Kyle Anderson and Danny Green out the door. That being said, DeMar DeRozan and Jakob Pertl are both above average. They've done well with Marco Bellinelli before. I think this is an easy over. I mean, I don't think, I don't expect great things out of them, but I think they haven't proved from last season like, funny part about losing say Danny Green Kyle Anderson they also lost Tony Parker and Tony Parker did not play well for them last season so it's like I think on the whole this team has improved from last year and is a team that has shown they can put up a 50 win squad it's depressing they should be putting up a 60 win squad who the freak knows what happens with um, happened with Kawhi but uh, this is another one where I think the over is the right move yeah, and that's a, this is a very popular opinion on NBA uh, Twitter. From what I can tell, everyone thinks the over is great here. For some reason, me personally, I'm a little bit down on the Spurs compared to everyone else. Um, I, I can see the logic, right? Because they're adding DeRozan and they're losing Kawhi, but they didn't have him at all last year, right? But I'm not necessarily sure that DeRozan will play better than Kyle Anderson, who they also lost. I don't think he will, but I, I'm saying I think the net impact of yeah, Pirtle, Bellinelli, eh, it, it's tough. But here's where I'm here's where I'm really suspicious is that Rudy Gay and Lamarcus Aldridge, Lamarcus Aldridge played pretty well for them, you know, how they normally play last season. They're kind of getting into their mid thirties now. Pau Gasol, who used to be really good, is you know getting into his late thirties now. I'm really suspicious that some of those players are just the bottom's gonna fall out. That's why I'm worried about the Spurs. But yeah, they could easily win fifty games. I'll, I'll try and get us out of here in about an hour, Brian. So these last three to me are really easy. I'm going to just say three in a row. The Toronto Raptors over under 55 and a half. Are you kidding me? Easy, easy over. over. They won 59 games last season. They even if they so that's what's annoying. Even if they don't add um, Kawhi, which of course they're going to in some capacity, replacing Demar Derozan with Danny Green and giving more minutes to uh, just dropped his name. Is it Vucevic? Um, Valanchunas. Valanchunas, yeah. thank you. Apologies for confusing two talented big men with a V. Yep. Although I believe Vucevic has, has been injured and not as good as he used to be. But Valanchunas, if Valanchunas gets more minutes and Green takes DeMar DeRozan's minutes, they, they're only going to lose a couple games, if any. And then Kawhi is anything, even 80% of himself. So unless someone knows something about the health of Kawhi, and I would be skeptical of, of you know, the Toronto Raptors, Taking on Kawhi if there were major injury concerns. Don't forget, the Spurs did back up the Brinks truck eventually to Kawhi and then then tried to say they didn't want him anymore. So it's like, I'm not as worried about his health given that two teams have shown interest in him. Easy, 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 easy. Oh, if they if if a team made the over last season, this is the same as like the Portland Trailblazers, then I don't think they did enough to get worse. And in the Raptors case, got better. Easy over. The the uh, Utah Jazz are an over under of 49. Again, this kills me because this I'm the easier over. I think. I, I, I'm the uh, the resident uh, Donovan Mitchell hater. Donovan Mitchell on the court hater, by the way, for what it's worth. And only in that I think he had no business being in the Rookie of the Year discussion. But uh, Donovan Mitchell uh, is going to get better just with age. That's just, that's just what happens. Rudy Gobert was injured part of last season, as I believe was Ricky Rubio. So if this team just has their star players back healthy and some standard aging, they're a better team than they were last year. Joe Ingles is in his prime. So it's like... This team won 48 wins last season with some with some major injuries. So if if they're just healthy, that's an easy. If they age and are healthy, that's an easy easy over. So take the over. Here's another Why, big one for the Jazz. Thabo Cephalosha was hurt last year, and he's really good. Sorry, keep going. And we'll we'll see. I mean, he's he's a little older, so that's it true. could 
will end up being a wash. Last team, I can't believe we got through them all, Brian. Washington Wizards will mean we have to push off the topic to next week. Oh, Brian. Washington Wizards, 44 and a half wins. They won 43 wins last season. They picked up Dwight Howard. Dwight Howard's still playing really good. I think that's an easy over. Um, I, I also think John Wall had an off season for some reason last year. So I think, you know, if John Wall bounces back, Dwight Howard stays even close to competitive. Uh, this team's an easy, easy over for that. So we had actually- Jeff Green, though. I'm suspicious of that. But well, I agree with you, though. Dwight Howard's I- really good. Uh, I don't. Th- I mean, the, the annoying thing is, I think, you know, when you're talking like if if Dwight Howard brings you eight wins and Jeff Green costs you three, I think it's still a net positive. Exactly. Why, though? God, why does Jeff Green is the, the king president, whatever you want to call it, of the why the hell does this player have an NBA career club up there with Austin Rivers? Jeff Actually, Green is an honorary Morris brother, in my opinion. Yeah, fair enough. I, I I don't know. I think the Morris brothers are honorary Jeff Greens. But anyway, we got through all the teams, Brian. I'll actually maybe try and like listen back and record what we said. Um, I, I'll say um, I thought this would be a topic, but because over unders took long enough, I'm just going to say we'll push it to next week because we're always looking for subjects next week. Just a shout out to B Ball Breakdown on Twitter, who has been really going hard on this. When you're coaching players, this idea of just being very punitive and yelling at the players and embarrassing them. You don't need to do that. And if you want to, you can just focus more on positive reinforcement, which is things that teachers and educators agree with. So I'm glad that there is a basketball coach catching up on it. I really do hope it catches on more mainstream. There are too many videos of college coaches, you know, Bobby Knight, the fact that he had a career as long as he did, being how he was to the players, that kind of stuff. I really hope we move past this idea that you have to yell at and mistreat people for to coach them correctly. Absolutely. All right. Well, I, I think I got my shout outs earlier in the show and then that. So, Brian, if you have any shout outs, I'll let you get it out. And then if not, that'll be our show. Oh, yeah. I'll just have one quick shout out to monitor for next week. An esports shout out because we're here on Twitch. We always got to try to cross Paul Knight between the different realms. Um, the Dota 2 International um, group stage was last week. The main event kicked off this week at Rogers Arena in Vancouver, I want to say is where that is. And um, this is always the largest cash um esports event of the year they again have almost 25 million dollars in prize purse with i want to say let's see i wrote it down the script here yes nearly 11 million again for first place so yeah the next few days that champion will get crowned so yeah i'll be watching the international awesome all right well if you caught us not through the website you can catch us at boxscoregeeks.com we've been the box score geek show you can catch us live every week uh we've done it two out of three weeks brian so it's almost a trend twitch.tv forward slash nerd numbers although i can guarantee you actually next week it will not be monday because i'm traveling brian so we'll we'll, we'll try and keep you in the loop next week people uh if you uh miss the live show you can catch the uh recaps on channel nerd numbers on youtube and then of course we have this in podcast form itunes and stitcher the box score geek show subscribe upvote it helps us out i've been your host Dre alvarez you can find me on twitter as nerd numbers co-host and producer brian Foster. you can find on twitter as box score brian and with us as always in spirit uh patrick minton you can find on twitter as nba geek that's been our show and we'll see you next week